Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed, we do. Lots to get to this morning. First of all, Biden's still in this will he or won't he after months of contemplation whether they might do something on the federal uh, gas tax. Uh, I will tell you about right. that. Also, a um, quite shocking ad coming out of the Republican Senate primary in Missouri from the candidate who is now, now the front runner in spite of allegations that he has abused both his ex-wife and his children. So we will tell you about all of that as well. Hillary Clinton, for some reason, being asked how Democrats can win in spite of the fact that, you know, maybe not the best person to go to advice you for how to win her? elections. But OK, we'll hear what she has to say. Taylor Lorenz getting a demotion at the Washington <laughs> Post. Talk to you about that. Um, Sagar's looking at TikTok. I am looking at whether the economy as we know it is completely ending. And we have um, a great guest on to break down the French election results, which were pretty stunning. But we wanted to start with some uh, very significant developments with regards to Russia's war in Ukraine. Yeah, this is really being underplayed by the Western press, frankly, because they don't think they understand the exact mechanics involved. Let's get and put this on the screen. So Russia is currently threatening retaliation against the country of Lithuania, who is banning goods of transit to Kaliningrad. So for those who aren't familiar with the geography of Eastern Europe, Kaliningrad is an enclave of Russia on the Baltic Sea, through which they have not necessarily a treaty, but an understanding with Lithuania and more that they will be able to transport goods by rail across the country of Lithuania to its own sovereign territory in Kaliningrad. This was a hard-won concession all throughout the breakup of the Soviet Union. It's a longtime outpost of the Russian Navy, and it, it's considered Russian territory, obviously, both by longstanding precedent and more. Now, currently, Lithuania is banning the transit of goods between Russian territory. So we're not talking about Russia transporting something to somewhere else. We're talking about Russia transporting something to its own sovereign territory. Now, the reason that this matters is that Lithuania is banning some of these goods on the basis that they claim that the goods have been sanctioned by the European Union. Lithuania is both a member of the EU, but more importantly for our purposes, is a member of the NATO alliance. And so, whenever they ban these Russian goods and transit, this would directly implicate the security of the United States. In terms of Russia, they are claiming an outrageous breach, both of precedent, but also saying that this is a direct meddling by NATO in its internal affairs, which, you know, on the propaganda campaign, on what they're saying both on television in Russia and within the Duma, this is some of the highest rhetoric that we have seen. So Dmitry Peskov says this, quote, this is an illegal move, quote, this decision is unprecedented. It is a violation of everything. We consider this illegal. The situation is more than serious. We need a serious, in-depth analysis in order to work out our response. And the foreign ministry said that Vilnius must reverse the, quote, openly hostile move. If the cargo transit between the Kaliningrad region and the rest of Russian Federation via Lithuania is not fully restored in the future, Russia reserves the right to take actions to protect its national interests. Interest. So that obviously is the highest escalation there of the discussion. The Lithuanians say that their hands are tied. They're like, look, the Moscow is spreading fake news. They are the ones who are just implementing the sanctions regime has been put in by the EU. They claim that their hands are tied. Their hands are not tied, okay? They could let the goods transit if they wanted to. And I think that this is especially escalatory on our part, Crystal, because this is Lithuania. It is a member of the NATO alliance. It does directly impact implicate what the Russians would consider their internal national security affairs. And this could actually be a real jump off point in terms of where a foreign escalation outside of Ukraine and the direct impact on all of us could see some, uh, it, it could, this is where we could see the flashpoint. And frankly, the press here is really not covering it all. This is a European story, yeah. despite major implications for everybody. Yeah, I think that's right. And there are two things you have to separate separate out. There's the reality, and then there's the um, symbolism yeah. of it. Right. So the reality is, number one, at least according to Lithuania, they are not blocking all goods. They're blocking maybe 50% of what's going there. It's, it's like still a lot. iron yeah. steel. It's still yeah. a lot. Um, reportedly, there is mass panic buying in the city of Kaliningrad right. um, because people are concerned they're not going to be able to get basic goods, foods, medicines, etc. Now, the reality is Russia has already said they're going to be able to circumvent this semi-blockade, whatever you want to call it, um, by shipping goods by sea. 
But in terms of, you know, a sense of a real attack on their sovereign territory, and clearly this rhetoric coming out of Russia is meant not only to signal their extreme displeasure, but also to galvanize their population against this type of act, this is really disastrous. And of course, Lithuania is saying, hey, look, we're just doing what you guys told us to do. We're just implementing the sanctions that all European nations are on board with. Well, that's not a great situation either, because that also directly implicates yes. us and our Western allies. Right. So it is for sure a dangerous, escalatory situation. And you never know where these flashpoints are going to come. You never know whether they're going to fizzle out, whether the Russians are just chest beating and they're going to back down, how this all works out. But it seems wildly unnecessary and inflammatory to engage in even, you know, even if we grant that this is a partial blockade, it seems wildly irresponsible and escalatory to do. Yeah, I think that that's really just the way to put it. And just to give you an idea, you know, Ukraine is actually supporting this. So the foreign minister of Ukraine actually put out a statement saying, Russia has no right to threaten Lithuania. Moscow has only itself to blame for the consequences of its unprovoked and unjustified invasion of Ukraine. We commend Lithuania Lithuania's principles stand and stand firmly by our Lithuanian friends. Obviously, the Baltic allies are the ones who are pumping most per capita in terms of GDP weapons into Ukraine. And frankly, they're the ones, you know, having been former Soviet Union states and members of NATO, where you're probably going to see the most amount of support, both at a domestic political level and from a foreign policy perspective. As this is something I've really been trying to warn from the beginning, which is that, remember, NATO is all of us. You know, it's not just the United States. As much as we may have a policy, the policy of Germany directly implicates us, the policy of the UK, and yes, now the policy of the Baltic states. So Lithuania, tiny country, you know, less probably, I, I don't know the exact population exactly, but their foreign policy has direct implications on us if there were to ever be an attack. Now, do I think an attack is coming? No. As you said, Russia currently is using a ferry system in order to get its goods to Kaliningrad, but the fact that this is spilling over directly outside of Ukraine. Ukraine and having a sanctions policy, which per Russian policy would be considered internal meddling in their affairs, I think it's a problem. And it also raises questions as to how things would work with Poland, which is also, frankly, a much stronger NATO ally, as well as all of the rest in addition to both Sweden and Finland, which are continuing their bid both for EU membership, or sorry, for uh, NATO membership, and Ukraine actually also in pursuing its bid for EU membership, which they say that they will be able to fast track. And at the same time, you know, we're seeing considerations and statements, again, not 100% noticed by the American press, but these are very important comments. Let's put this up there on the screen. This is from NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg. Here's what he says, quote, the war in Ukraine could last for years, he said in an interview with the daily German newspaper Bild, while he was reiterating calls for Western countries to provide long-term support for Kyiv. Here's what he says, quote, we must be prepared for this to last for years. We must not weaken in our support of Ukraine, even if the costs are high, not only in terms of military support, but also because of rising energy and food prices. And I think that this is the next phase of the uh, way that that the West is gonna try and sell it, which is their domestic populations are starting to get fed up. We have $5 gas here in the US, it does not even compare to what gas prices are in Europe. And in Europe, they're not just seeing the type of inflation that we're seeing at the gas pump, Crystal, they are seeing it in terms of their energy bills. Because people need to understand, uh, Italy and Germany have been cut off by Russian pipelines for natural gas to the extent of 40% in Italy's case, 60% in Germany. At the same time, an LNG uh, export hub here in the United States exploded and won't be able to deliver LNG for a minimum of 90 days. So prices in Europe went up 17% just in a single day in terms of electricity. So that is a preview of what is to come. And I just think that the longer that the war continues, the longer that there is not any peace process, you know, frankly, the Russians too, you know, they, they, nobody's stopping them from also actually trying to Astro Priest. And then also on the Ukrainians, if we don't set up the chessboard in the correct way, we're going to see more Kaliningrad type incidents, yeah. which could have escalatory problems on the part of the entire West, both the EU and the NATO alliance. So I think this is why we're spending some time on this this morning. At this point, the sanctions regime is making me feel insane because, yeah, I mean, I mean we're yeah. literally sanctioning our own people 
and devastating um, developing world, global oh, yeah. south nation. I mean, yeah. the level of famine and hunger that we are sparking in parts of the world to just like casually hand wave that like, eh, you know, the costs are high, but we got to keep going. Like that's nothing. And then the reality is the sanctions have completely backfired. So you've imposed all this pain and austerity on your own populations and on vulnerable populations around the entire globe. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Putin has never gotten more revenue than right now yeah, made a, because— I, I want, let, Let's stick on this point. Yeah. He made $100 billion, Crystal. Right. That's more than they needed to fund the entire war in Ukraine. Uh, literally, yeah. re record-breaking oil yeah. profits. <laughs> literally. I yeah. mean, because, directly because of our sanctions. Yes. Are ordinary Russian people hurting? Yes. Was that the goal? To right. starve out some, like, poor working-class Russian who had nothing to do with this? And by the way— all of these actions, and the, we, this was predictable from the beginning, and in fact, we did predict mm -hmm. it from the beginning. What is Putin telling his domestic population? He's saying the West is out to get you. They want to destroy Russia. And then we say, hey, we're wa launching all-out economic warfare to destroy Russia. That plays right into his hand. He and his cronies, they are not suffering one bit. And we're going to talk about some of his comments later in an important speech last week that I think shows, demonstrates how sort of comfortable he's feeling right now from an economic perspective. Meanwhile, this is rallying ordinary Russians to his side, proving his point. So all of this has been a disaster. I mean, listen, if it was actually working, right, if the, if the Ukrainians were winning, if the, mm -hmm. this wasn't like an effective sanction on our own populations and a subsidy, by the way, to um, the Chinese middle class yes. and at the, at the expense of our own middle class, um, if it was actually bleeding Russia dry and, and impacting their ability to wage this war, okay, we could have That's a debate a about story. it. I right. still have issues with it, but we could, there would be a reasonable debate there. At this point, what is the case for continuing in the same direction? I just genuinely don't understand. We discussed this yesterday with Peter Zihan. I, again, think it's worth emphasizing. Russia made $100 billion in just 100 days post the uh, sanctions regime, and Russia has now become the single largest supplier of oil to the country of China, even surpassing Saudi Arabia because they're willing to sell it at a discount rate at the current global market in addition to India. So we have created a discount market for the Chinese and the Indians. I guess props to them. You know, they're getting a nice deal yeah. on oil. Yeah. At the same time, our regime, our, our country is paying outrageous sums for oil and gas in addition to the entire, you know, unified West. And then the Russian military Putin war machine, war machine is enriched to a historic degree. They have plenty of money in order to conduct the war. The counter to what we're saying is, yeah, Crystal and Sagar, but it's going to take a couple years for those sanctions to kick in. Okay, so as the NATO chief says, you want us to pay for three years, and again, okay, let's say it was working on the battlefield, but we don't currently have indications of that. Let's put this up there on the screen. You know, Ukraine is really suffering right now in the faltering def defense of Severnodonetsk, apologies, Ukrainians, and they are rushing troops there to try and reinforce, but as we pointed out previously, the Ukrainians are losing and, and I'm talking killed in action, almost 200 people a day. They're suffering between 500 to 1,000 casualties a day in terms of wounded. They say, look, it's fine. We have a million guys. We have another 2 million that we can call up. But seeing reports here, and this is always a problem, some of these guys have barely had six weeks of basic training before they're even sent to the front line. So you don't necessarily have the best <laughs> troops. Of course, Russia also has conscripts. They have problems. They've suffered probably 10 to 20,000 casualties as well. They're not giving us the numbers, but their ability in order to continue the grinding war of attrition is certainly able to outlast the current Ukrainian defensives. And same with the oil prices, because yes, the sanctions regime will hurt Russian oil the Russian oil economy. In a couple of years, they're not going to be able to get the parts in order to update their systems or keep maintenance. But Ukraine's got to last three years yeah, you, for that you, to happen. You want to subject this nation to a war for three I mean, years? I, I, I mean, look, the Ukrainians you know? get to decide too. And, and to be honest, like it's not like Zelensky is trying to do anything in terms of peace. Like, let's be very clear about yeah, that but, too. Yeah, but but we have to yeah. ask ourselves why that is. Yeah, I, I agree. mean, I think right. that that has a lot to do with the posture and positioning of their largest patron, overwhelmingly largest patron, us, the United I, States of America. I, agree with I you. mean, we shouldn't really pretend that this is anything other than a true proxy war between the U.S. and Russia. So. 
look, what Russia's doing right now is more or less easy for them. They're basically sitting back, shelling these areas, kind of holding their position, making steady progress in the eastern part of Ukraine. And I saw some credible analysis that said basically like their strategy right now is to do that, which is very sustainable for them, while they rebuild their own troops and rebuild mm -hmm. their own capabilities. And then what? So what Russia is probably thinking is they suffered, you know, humiliating defeats in the early phase of this war, no doubt about it. The more maximalist aims of their goals, I think, are basically off the table. So what they're working to do now is to regain some leverage. I mean, that's what you see with the um, really unconscionable, you know, food blockade that they're engaging in that oh, is also— Oh, it's horrific, yeah. It is horrific. It is absolutely horrific. Um, that's, you know, one part of their strategy, the cutting off of uh, natural gas to Italy. So that sort of retaliatory— economic warfare, that's part of their strategy to try to gain some leverage in whenever the end state negotiations occur, and then trying to rebuild some of their military capacity and um, gain ground in eastern Ukraine. That's the other part of their strategy, likely, to try to gain some leverage over the end state of these negotiations. But I don't know how we can look at, in particular, our economic approach, our economic warfare approach to this conflict and say that this has been successful. Yeah, because it has been a failure. It has had the exact opposite effect of what everybody in D.C. told us it was going to do. It has, no, in, like, undoubtedly at this point, it has strengthened his hand. Um, it's just impossible to see it otherwise. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.